first time I've actually had a chance to talk at a pediatric symposium. And as an adult liver doctor, um, I don't see any kids. So I spend quite a bit of time thinking about this. And originally the title is Metabolic Syndrome, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. And when I figured out it was a 10 minute talk, I realized we had to get down to the ugly very quickly. So um, the bad, as you know, is that metabolic syndrome is really the only scourge in the Western world left to conquer. The constellation of obesity, insulin resistance, heart disease, dyslipidemia, um, and I consider liver disease as part of that. So liver fibrosis due to fatty liver disease is part of that constellation of metabolic syndrome. We don't have good cures. Bariatric surgery is an option, but probably not for the pediatric population. So it really gets down to the ugly of, well, what, what can we do about this and where should we be looking? So for me, and I'm excited to tell you about this today, this is a, a, a newish breakout project for us that's been going on for about three years, is to really hone in on one aspect of the metabolic syndrome that causes the most problem in liver clinic, and that's liver fibrosis. And at the top you see a normal liver, and at the bottom you see the results, the scarred knobby football that results from years of chronic injury and inflammation. And the basic assumption that fat drives this in metabolic syndrome is fundamentally flawed, and we can spend two hours talking about why that is. It's the biology and activity of the fibrosis-making cells within the liver that leads to this, and eventually to cancer. Now, one of the things I noticed in my review of the literature is that in adults it's bad, but in pediatrics it's actually worse. The rate at which children are being diagnosed with metabolic syndrome, and I think the answer to how many are being diagnosed with liver disease is actually unknown because it's poorly studied. In fact, you could probably come up with less articles than I have fingers on two hands looking at the genetics of fibrosis and metabolic syndrome in children. It's a really, really short list. Um, so. In the pediatric world, fatty liver is going to be and remain the real only major problem. Biliary atresia, yes, you have that issue. Hep B, we know how to break that cycle. Hep C is going to go away very quickly. Alcohol doesn't come into play. So you're left with the genetic disorders and then by the numbers, the thing that affects at least one half, if not two thirds of the United States population, which is fatty liver. So that's what I'm going to tell you about today. And to, to lead you into the idea that genetics plays a role in fatty liver disease. I, I go back to some data across a six-year period in Parkland, Texas, representing medicine visits uh, in 57,000 people. And in the white bars, you can see, based on the different ethnicities, the prevalence of diabetes is what you've heard about. People who are African-American or Hispanic tend to have more diabetes. But what's quite surprising is that the rate of fatty liver-related cirrhosis, or NASH cirrhosis, uh, varies much more widely. And this, this actually plays into a, a, a clinical observation. I have just as many African-American patients as Hispanic patients who have diabetes. But the ones who die of liver disease are the Hispanic population. I can't remember the last time I saw somebody from, with an African-American background die of a liver-related cancer from NASH cirrhosis. So there's clearly something there. And just to, to show you the review of what's been done, this is an article from 2011 tabulating all the human GWAS studies or genome-wide association studies um, that have to do with liver disease. And most of them actually have to do with bilirubin levels or GGTs, which by the way, we never even bother checking. I'm not sure what they were motivated to check there. Um, and for bilirubin, you can see there, there are some associations, 10 to the minus 324th. Wow, that's a really small number. That's a strong association. Well, that's because they have managed to identify the gene that's implicated in Gilbert's syndrome as the causative feature of having an elevated bilirubin. Well, that means they've identified, by genetic association, a monogenic disease. So, of course, you're going to have a highly statistically significant p-value. That's not the case for diabetes, that's not the case for obesity, and it's not the case for liver fibrosis. In fact, the only studies, and actually they're all related, they all belong to a, a corporate investment in looking for genes that uh, influence liver fibrosis. Not liver fat, but liver fibrosis. And the p-values, the significance here is really quite small, it's 10 to the minus 4. Even worse, the number of patients we're talking about would make most GWA people laugh because they're in the low hundreds not the thousands. Even worse, the number of uh, SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphisms used to map the genome, is a paltry 24,000. So that's like saying, I know the causative gene is between San Diego and Washington, and Washington DC, but I don't know exactly where. 
you need a tight mapping structure in order to say, you know, the, the culprit is between Pico and Santa Monica. That's where we should be looking. So the other one I've highlighted here is the, the one very well quoted uh, GWA related to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease comes from Helen Hobbs at UT Southwestern. And all she did was run a bunch of humans through MRIs and measure fat in their liver. And she hit upon some low-hanging fruit. It's a great paper in Nature Genetics, and a lot's been, been done from that. In fact, one of two GWAS studies in the pediatric population identified the same gene that's listed here, PNPLA3. Okay? It happens to, this SNP happens to code for a, a change in the protein, which is really quite uncommon, and, it, and its effects have been well delineated. So... My lab set out to really understand not just metabolism and, and metabolic syndrome, but to understand the contribution of genetics to hepatic fibrosis. The way we chose to do this is by collaborating with Jake Lucis in the Department of Genetics. And his, uh, his model goes like this. He uses the hybrid mouse diversity panel. This consists of 100 strains. Actually, now there's more than 200, but for the sake of argument here, it's 100 of classically inbred and recombinantly inbred mouse strains. So here are three different types of mice. They're all laboratory mice. They're all wild type, but they look different. They're like different types of dogs. They can breed, they can have offspring, and they can genetically reassort their, their genetic markers, their SNPs, by homologous recombination. So essentially, by adding in 100 strains of mice, you can refine the mapping power in a genome-wide association study and really narrow in on a very small piece of the genome because you have so many different types of strains. The equivalent in humans would be, say, taking an Okinawan Japanese population and asking them to mate, say, with a Yanomamo tribes member and have their children then inbreed for 20 generations. Okay, that's not going to happen. It's ethically a no-no, and it's practically impossible. So you can do that with mice. You can control their diet, you can control where they live, uh, and control what they do. We also have complete genomic sequence for all these different strains, and we have a large number of SNPs. We have a large number of flag posts labeling streets all the way from Pico in Santa Monica up to Fifth Avenue in, in New York City. What you need is a good quantitative trait, and the quantitative trait we are choosing is to measure hepatic fibrosis. In the original description of this panel, Jake and his colleagues simply took blood from mice, one or two mice of every one of these hundred strains, and measured cholesterol. And you find that there's about a fourfold variation amongst these hundred strains. And you can do make a, a genome-wide association map, a so-called Manhattan plot, because these peaks look like the buildings of Manhattan. The higher the peak, the stronger the association that there's something here on chromosome one that predicts HDL cholesterol levels. Okay. And so that's how you go about the business of making genetic association. The jumping to how pathway biology intersects with that is a whole other story. So when I heard about that, I bit the bullet and said, you know what, we got to do this for liver fibrosis because nobody has done this and nobody's probably going to do this. So three years ago, we set out to do exactly that. And to do so, we had two choices. We have a chemical toxin called carbon tetrachloride where if we inject either vehicle or carbon tetrachloride twice a week for six weeks, you can see the results. The picroserious red staining in the liver here shows this nice wispy fibrosis, the scar tissue. You can also feed mice a high fat, oops, that's not good, high fat diet. And this is one, this is one strain that happens to be resistant to a high fat diet. There's no red fibrosis here. There's a lot of fat, but there's no fibrosis. Whereas this one has a lot of fat and fibrosis, so this is a susceptible strain. So you can see already that there is a, a variation in what you get. But this was the model we chose to use because it is controlled by us. We can inject it on a weight-based dosing. We don't have to do any uh, further engineering with the mice like you do with the fatty diet because mice don't develop fatty liver like humans. Uh, and it's fairly quick. Rather than 12 weeks, we're talking about six weeks, which is still pretty long. So we, we, we took our slides here and we said, well, how are we going to make a quantitative trait? We made a quantitative trait by developing an automated algorithm that calculates how much percentage of that liver slice contains red collagen. Furthermore, it's refined so that it excludes the normal vascular, perivascular collagen you would find around big vascular spaces. 
And it turns out to work so well that when we put it up against a, a local pathologist with a, a, a categorical staging of fibrosis system, it was very clear that we had a strong correlation between our automated percent digital fibrosis and what the clinical pathologist saw. saw. And of course, all the different vehicle-treated mice have a very low basal level of fibrosis, which is what you'd expect. This was so good that we've actually gone on to, we have a provisional patent on this technology because it requires no, no post hoc analysis. So you can potentially do thousands of slides in humans at once. And we've actually uh, started to publish some things on that. So we thought it was a good measure. And so the exciting part for me is that three years later, I get this one slide for you, right? So there are 98 strains of mice represented here, uh, 726 mice, half of which got vehicle, half of which got carbon tetrachloride. And uh, you can see that there is actually quite a variation in, in how much fibrosis develops. It's actually about four to five fold. Um, since we don't know whether this is a Gaussian distribution, we log transformed the difference between carbon tetrachloride and the ve baseline vehicle in order to get a really truly normalized set of data. And so this is the set, this is the set of strains that we're using. Um, if you just measure carbon tet alone, um, it changes a little bit, but the rank ordering, the, the most fibrotic strains are still up there at the top. And so we created a Manhattan plot, and we have a clear peak here on chromosome 13, which we have now been able to drill down on. And I won't explain how we go from, uh, how we define this block, but basically it says the things that are near this peak snip that vary uh, are, define our block of interest. And within that block, there are about eight to nine genes. So in human GWAS studies, you often have to deal with 50 to 100 different genes. And then you're left with, how are we going to uh, analyze this, uh, the biology? But now we're down to eight or nine. So in conclusion, I'm showing you that association mapping identifies a small block of genes that influences the deposition of fibrosis in mouse livers. A couple of those genes have been implicated in fibrosis in other human organs, which is what we're excited about. But we didn't have to pick that, that automated it, digital histopathology measurement. We can do qPCR. We can look in the serum. We're collaborating with Novartis to do comprehensive uh, analysis of all the livers. And using this unbiased screening, uh, we will be able to investigate pathway biology that I think will be relevant not only for adults, but for, for, for kids as well. And so I'd like to thank the people that did this work the 8,700 injections that these two people did over three years, uh, the genetics know-how of my collaborators in the Lucis lab and our folks here in the pathology department. So thank you for your attention. Um, so parental nutrition or IV nutrition um, is a life-saving solution that provides both macro and micronutrients to children in times of prolonged fasting when they're unable to take uh, sufficient enteral nutrition by mouth. A large population of children depend upon um, IV nutrition, both in the inpatient setting and the outpatient setting. Um, in fact, two groups of children include premature neonates and neonates with congenital or acquired gastrointestinal disorders. And without IV nutrition or parental nutrition, these children would succumb to dehydration, malnutrition, and eventually death. Now, while the vast majority of these children are able to be weaned from parental nutrition, and achieve enteral autonomy, autonomy, some of these children actually end up developing something known as intestinal failure. Um, and they depend upon parental nutrition for months to years, if not a lifetime. And usually that's secondary to a disease known as either functional or surgical short bowel syndrome. So while PN is life-saving, as I've mentioned, it does come with a host of complications, which are listed here. And I'm specifically interested in a disease known as intestinal failure associated liver disease. So intestinal failure associated liver disease, also known as IFELD, occurs in children who are exposed to prolonged periods of parental nutrition. It's manifested clinically as jaundice um, and, by, and biochemically by a rising direct bilirubin. And histologically, what we see on liver biopsies is cholestasis, eventually steatosis or fatty liver, um, and eventually fibrosis and cirrhosis. And some of these children can actually um, go on to develop fulminant liver failure. So is intestinal failure associated liver disease a problem in the pediatric population? Well, I would say yes, and that's, that's certainly why I'm here. It's one of the top diagnoses for children listed for transplant, and that includes multivisceral transplant and combined small intestine and liver transplant. Mortality awaiting for uh, these transplants is quite high. In fact, it's two times higher 
than uh, children who are awaiting a heart-lung transplant. And those who are lucky enough to go on to receive a transplant, their five-year survival rate is about 60 to 80%, depending upon the child and the institution. And transplant certainly isn't a panacea. It exchanges one set of problems for another. These children face rejection. They also, they're also at increased risk for um, life-threatening infections um, and malignancy, specifically lymphomas. Transplants are costly. The first year um, out of transplant is approximately a million dollars, and thereafter a half a million dollars. And unfortunately for children with advanced um, intestinal failure associated liver disease, there's very little options available to them other than a combined liver small intestine transplant. So I'm specifically interested in what in the parental nutrition is hepatotoxic. And as many of you are aware, when we prescribe parental nutrition, we also prescribe IV fat or fatty acid emulsion. And that's because it's a dense source of calories and also it prevents an essential fatty acid deficiency. Um, so here in the US, um, we have a product known or commercially known as intralipid. It's entirely soybean based. It's dosed usually at three grams per kilo per day. It contains a little bit of the antioxidant vitamin E. It's packed full of hepatotoxic phytosterols. And when we look at the polyunsaturated fatty acid content, it mainly contains omega-6 fatty acids, specifically in the form of linolenic acid, which is an essential um, polyunsaturated fatty acid. On the other hand, there is a product uh, commercially available as a megaven. It's intravenous fish oil. Um, so it's based off of, uh, entirely based off of fish oil. It's dosed at one gram per kilo per day, has a much higher concentration of vitamin E. It lacks hepatotoxic phytosterols altogether. And then when we look at the PUFA content, um, it does contain some omega-6 fatty acids, but it contains um, EPA and DHA, which are absent in um, the standard formulation used here in the US. And we know that EPA and DHA are antithrombotic, they're anti-inflammatory, and they're incredibly important for neuro and visual development, um, particularly in neonates and children. So about four to five years ago, we asked um, two questions. Um, does giving a lower dose of fat matter? And does changing the composition of the IV fatty acid emulsion matter? Um, so with regards to the second question, we started um, a treatment study whereby children with advanced intestinal failure associated liver disease, their IV um, soybean oil or intralipid was discontinued and they were provided with um, fish oil monotherapy for a finite period and that was for six months. We compared them to historical controls to determine whether or not we were able to biochemically reverse their liver disease. To answer the dose question, um, we performed randomized control trials looking at children who are at risk for cholestasis, specifically premature neonates and neonates with gastrointestinal disorders. These children were randomized to two different doses of fat, the standard dose, which was three grams per kilo per day, and a lower dose, which was one, one gram per kilo per day. And our primary outcome was cholestasis. So with regards to the first study, which was the treatment study, um, again, these are children with advanced intestinal failure associated liver disease. The median age in both groups, the fish oil group and the historical cohort who received soybean oil, was about nine months. Um, these children were premature with a median gestational age of 34 weeks. And they had extreme short bowel syndrome with a median um, intestinal length of about 25 centimeters. And what we saw over time, as indicated by this gray line here, is that their liver disease reversed biochemically in comparison to the historical cohort, whereby their bilirubins continued to rise substantially. And in fact, after about three months of therapy, we were able to reverse 75% of these children's disease, as indicated here by a Kaplan-Meier curve. We're also interested in growth because as I mentioned, fish oil is dosed at one gram per kilo per day, while soybean oil is usually dosed at three grams per kilo per day. So when we compared before and after treatment within the fish oil cohort, while growth was certainly suboptimal, which is something you'd expect in a patient population with intestinal failure, we actually saw some improvement in z-scores with regards to weight, length, and head circumference. And not surprising, when we looked in the plasma and in the RBC membrane, we saw reversal of the fatty acid ratios. So it's important to maintain a specific omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. And in these children, they had very high ratios, which would be considered, un, um, considered unhealthy. And we saw a decrease in linolenic acid and omega-6 fatty acid, and of course, a very striking increase in both EPA and DHA, and actually a decrease in alpha-linolenic acid. 
We're also interested in looking at the phytosterols, and as I mentioned, phytosterols are known to be hepatotoxic. So when you and I consume phytosterols in our diet, we don't absorb them. Um, very little crosses the intestine and is absorbed into the bloodstream. And these phytosterols are hepatotoxic for a variety of reasons, but specifically they inhibit enzymes that convert bile acids into, I mean, convert cholesterol into bile acids. And they also inhibit specific bile acid transporters in the liver. And this results in a cholestatic liver. And what we saw at baseline in our fish oil cohort is cytosterol, a type of phytosterols, was incredibly high. In fact, these concentrations would be considered toxic. By three months, um, they had decreased significantly, and actually at six months, they were nearly undetectable. We also were interested in looking at markers for lipid trafficking, knowing that this disease is not just about cholestasis, but also about steatosis. And we did some proteomic studies, and we saw some changes in specific apolipoproteins, specifically C3. Um, and what we saw was an increase in this apolipoprotein, and this protein inhibits um, fat uptake in the liver. And not surprisingly, we saw a nice decrease in triglyceride concentrations in our fish oil cohort in comparison to um, their soybean oil counterparts. Um, so that, that completes sort of the treatment study, and we concluded, or um, we at least as of today, believe it's an effective treatment. We think it's fairly safe. Um, but we were still left with the dose question. Does dose actually matter since fish oil is dosed at one gram per kilo per day? We're not just changing the composition, but we're decreasing the dose. Um, so we performed a randomized controlled trial. This was in collaboration with Yale University, whereby 140 premature neonates were randomized either to low dose soybean oil or to the standard dose soybean oil that we use in most NICUs across the United States. And these neonates were fairly premature, 28 weeks gestation, and their median birth weight was about 800 grams. And our primary outcome, again, was, was cholestasis. And so what did we see? It was quite surprising. We saw no difference in liver function. It didn't matter how we sliced the data. There was no difference in bilirubins, transaminases over time, or at specific time points. Um, so we, we didn't find what we expected, which was quite surprising. And also very interesting, despite the fact that we gave these children less calories, and this was certainly significant within the first two weeks of life, growth was not different over time and at specific time points. And that's with regards to weight, length, and head circumference. And we also looked at z-scores um, and growth velocities. One of um, the med students who we work with, Margaret Ong, she has a poster here today. And she followed this preterm cohort over time at six months and 12 months corrected gestational age to look at long-term growth and neurodevelopment. And this was obviously a very important safety marker, and she saw no difference with regards to those variables. So back to our original hypothesis. Um, we had hypothesized that altering the composition um, and the dose of a fatty acid emulsion would alter the amount of phytosterols, inflammation, and the type of polyunsaturated fatty acids that the liver is exposed to. And this would then, or hence, alter the development and progression of intestinal failure associated liver disease, which is manifested eventually histologically as cholestasis and steatosis. So what do we conclude? Well, as of today, I'd say dose probably matters somewhat, but composition is probably where the money's at, considering what we've seen and what others have published. Um, however, I would still caution everyone that this disease is multifactorial. It's not just about fat. It's not just about parental nutrition. There's other major players, particularly sepsis, that we, we can't ignore. Um, and lastly, I think further research is needed in this area, and a multidisciplinary team approach um, is incredibly important. And I think that will help improve the lives of children with intestinal failure. Thank you. Well, this is a big picture talk. OK, it's called Calling Mary Poppins, a public health approach to the obesity crisis. Well, everyone knows that obesity is bad for health. Two out of three adults and one out of three children are overweight or obese. That's over 150 million Americans. And obesity is an underlying cause of heart disease, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, cancer, premature death. It's costing our health care system in excess of $150 billion a year. So why is this happening, and what can we do about it? Well, the dominant conversation about obesity in America today is that it's a matter of personal responsibility. We tend to think that if someone's overweight or obese, it's the result of their own conscious choices. And we also think that everyone should have the capacity to control their weight. But just think about it. 
If everyone had the capacity to control their weight, well, why wouldn't they? This is my mom and dad, and as you can see, my dad struggled with his weight, and he did that for his entire adult life. Uh, no matter how hard he tried, he was never successful in losing weight for more than a few months at a time. And he knew what to do. He was a dentist. I mean, he knew he should have eat, eaten less and exercised more, but um, he couldn't do it. Um, he was otherwise very hardworking. He worked six days a week. He seldom took vacation. He raised three children, and he put us all through college and graduate school. And he was the kind of person who, if you asked him to do something, and he said he would be there, and you know, he was always you know, someone you could count on. And nobody could ever say that he was personally irresponsible. And that's the way it is with most people who are overweight or obese. You know, they get to work on time, they pay their taxes, they raise children, they volunteer for their communities. If controlling one's weight was as straightforward as meeting someone's personal responsibilities, there's no doubt that we would not be having an obesity epidemic. So what I want to suggest is that personal responsibility is neither the cause nor the solution to the obesity epidemic. Now, I specialize in public health, so I want to give you a public health perspective on this. So what's public health? It's about creating conditions in which people can be healthy. Now, 150 years ago, you know, the top, we had uh, a lot of problems with waterborne diseases. And, you know, clean water is one of public health's great successes. Now, imagine if we relegated clean water to a matter of personal responsibility and we did not mandate that all houses and buildings have clean water. Well, we'd probably spend, be spending all of our time fetching water, bringing it home, boiling it, filtering it, figuring out how to store it. And so you just have to appreciate how important the conditions in which we live are you know, for our everyday lives. And public health is about reducing risk for individuals and also reducing burden. So in order to appreciate how the conditions in which we live are important for obesity, let's imagine that we can take food out of the equation and instead let's replace it with alcohol. Now just imagine that in America today, we treated alcohol the way we treat food. So just imagine that for pennies more, we served supersized portions of alcohol. And what if we had all-you-can-drink buffets for one price? And what if alcohol were sold in vending machines? And they were in every office building, on every floor, and in every break room. And what if, instead of candy at the cash register in most places like this bookstore, we had alcohol at the cash register? And what if it was also in car washes? You know, we had alcohol at the cash register. And in hardware stores, instead of, you know, candy, chips, and soda, we had beer, wine, and whiskey. And what if we had no restrictions on the sale of alcohol to children, and it was up to parents to always control what they did, how much they drank? You know, just imagine what the consequences would be. Well, we'd probably see more people who were drunk all the time, more people uh, you know, with traffic, uh, alcohol-related traffic crashes, more people uh, dying of liver cirrhosis, more domestic violence, more alcohol-related chronic diseases. But you know what? We don't even have to guess, because we can look at our own history. Because 200 years ago, we had no regulations controlling the sale of alcohol. And America had a reputation as a nation of drunkards. Alcohol was ubiquitous. It was the drink of choice. It was served to children. Employers often paid their workers with allotments of alcohol as part of their wages. And the per capita consumption of alcohol was more than double what it is today. So here's a graph of alcohol consumption. And you can see how high it was compared to now. This is from the end of the 18th century to the present. And as we improved the technology for distilling alcohol, it was more available. People were drunk all the time. And, and it was a problem. It wasn't because of drunk driving. Look, 1820, we didn't have cars. It was families losing their breadwinners. It was workers not performing on the job. Businesses were lo losing a lot of money. And society said, we need to do something about it. And they recognized that people were being set up to drink too much because alcohol was everywhere they went. 
And so they uh, establish laws and regulations to limit the accessibility and availability of alcohol. They prohibited sales to children. They limited the days and hours when alcohol could be sold. They, start, they started policies, no drinking on the job. And businessmen subsidized alcohol-free taverns so people could socialize without being pressured to drink. And we continued with more and more alcohol regulations. And of course, in retrospect, we can say prohibition went too far. But we still retain a wide variety of alcohol regulations. And the things that work to control alcohol, like standardized portions, restricting accessibility, restricting impulse marketing, that's where the conversation to control obesity needs to begin. Is it fair to compare alcohol to food? And I say yes, absolutely, because Consuming a moderate amount of each is not a problem, but people get into trouble when they're consuming too much of both. People drank too much 200 years ago because they were living in an alcohol swamp. And today, people are eating too much because we've allowed our country to become a food swamp. And food in particular, junk food and sugar-sweetened beverages are ubiquitous, cheap, and marketed relentlessly. So I just want to do a really quick experiment for you to understand why living in a food swamp is a problem. Um, oh, uh, do I have that? Oh, I'm sorry, I don't have it. I have to skip that experiment. It's a wrong talk. <laughs> but what I did have was a picture of a hat and a cake. And I say, how many of you are looking at the hat? And of course, everyone's looking at the cake. And uh, marketers know that we're vulnerable to food placement, and that's why they pay retailers to put their products on end dial displays where people can't ignore them. And whatever they put in those places increases sales like by 50% to threefold. And, and from those locations, uh, uh, they account for 30% of all supermarket sales. So whatever they put there influences what we eat. If they put more junk food there, we eat more junk food. And so what I want to propose is that we ask food outlets to stop putting us at risk. And restaurants do that. They routinely serve people more calories than they can burn. And it's a problem because people can't figure out how much to eat just by looking at it. And we know that the more people eat out, the more likely they are to be overweight or obese. And so if we standardize portion sizes, so restaurants would just automatically serve one portion that would help people avoid the risk of obesity. And if people wanted more, they could order a second portion, third portion, the same way they can order a second or third alcoholic beverage. So standardizing portions would empower people to control how much they were consuming. And then I think we need to restrict impulse marketing. I mean, do we really want to encourage people to make impulsive choices? No, we want people to make choices that are careful and deliberate. And do we want foods like this in the easy reach of children? No. I mean, I'm a mom. I have four kids. And when they were young, they were mischievous. I used to dread having to take them to the supermarket if I couldn't find a babysitter, because wouldn't you know it, they'd be grabbing whatever it is they wanted, sugar sweetened cereals, trying to hide it in the cart, hoping I wouldn't notice before we got to the checkout. So um, am I talking about a nanny government? I guess, in a way, I am. And that's because nannies care. And of course, you know, you have the perfect nanny, Mary Poppins. And you probably don't remember, but Mary Poppins was an early proponent of portion control. She recommended one spoon of sugar. And in comparison, you know, we've got the companies in control, like Coca-Cola, that they would be delighted if we would drink 16 spoons of sugar every day in a 20-ounce soda, which is way more than the American Heart Association says we should have to avoid the risk of heart disease. So we need, uh, if we want to reverse the obesity epidemic, we need to steer the conversation away from personal responsibility towards creating a safer food environment. You know, if the alcohol example tells us one thing, is that traumatic improvement is possible and sustainable with just moderate regulations. Um, science tells us that people are being set up to eat too much by the way food is promoted and marketed. But we know that millions of Americans were able to control how much they drank when they didn't have to face alcohol everywhere they went. So again, we have to stop thinking that obesity is about 100 million individual failures rather than the consequence of living in a food swamp. Because if we don't, we'll have a bigger, fatter crisis. And you know, we really need to drain the food swamp. 
And I just want to tell you, I have a book that came out on this topic called A Big Fat Crisis. Thank you. I have to tell you, okay, I, I put this together like in five minutes yesterday, and I thought to myself, come on, Bridget. I mean, <laughs> you know, this is a backup talk. That, who has to ever give that? So I'm not, <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not prepared for this. And forget about the time limit, okay? No, but this will be quick. All right, so we're interested, I'm in uh, pediatric GI here at UCLA, and we're interested in stem cells as a way of curing and managing patients with epithelial defects of the gut. So the, boy, this is, it's easy to be the moderator. <laughs> okay, so what we're talking about are kids with intestinal failure. These are patients who, who cannot sustain normal weight gain um, by enteral feeds. They actually need intravenous nutrition to actually grow and to thrive. And there are various forms of intestinal failure, but what we're gonna talk about today are a variety of disorders that actually have uh, primary defects in the epithelium. And our focus is trying to find ways of, of isolating and growing kind of intestinal epithelium for therapeutic uh, 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 reasons. So all of the, the lineages of the small bowel, which is really our main focus, and we've done similar work in the colon, um, there are four, really five different subtypes of cells. They're enterocytes that absorb all the nutrients. They're panet cells that form, uh, that produce defensins and have important roles in innate immunity. They're goblet cells that produce mucus. There are interendocrine cells that actually produce hormones. There's actually M cells as well that I don't even have on here. Uh, but they all have one thing in common. They all come back from the stem cell or derived from the stem cell population that was identified by Hans Klevers from the Netherlands about four years ago. And uh, we've worked out in, uh, many groups have worked out in great detail, mostly in mouse, how basically we get from, uh, essentially from a stem cell, uh, a stem cell actually to each of these different uh, four to five lineages. So the long-term hope eventually is in treating patients with epithelial defects that require long-term uh, TPN is to be able to find ways of removing their uh, epithelium, doing gene therapy, and actually then expanding that epithelium and basically uh, uh, putting, ablating their native stem cells and then actually putting uh, their corrected stem cells back in into the stem cell niche and get normal growth. That is basically the long-term goal. Um, and most of the work that's really been done by Hans Cleaver's group and many groups now uh, nationally, internationally, really have focused on going from an isolated stem cell population in vitro and being able to expand it uh, really pretty remarkably and most of these cells, most of this work actually, of course, is in mice. Our work is actually primarily in humans, and we've taken two approaches. We've taken, as you've heard today, uh, the uh, pluripotent stem cell approach. And what we've done is we've been able to, to isolate from patients with a variety of different epithelial defects, uh, skin fibroblasts, that we've gone ahead and reprogrammed um, and then taken it through this whole process of development from definitive endoderm using various uh, uh, growth factors to hindgut to intestinal epithelium. And we've been able to show, and this is kind of what the gut epithelium looks like in that setting that's really surrounded by mesenchyme. What we're able to, uh, to demonstrate is that this gut epithelium actually produces hormones. Uh, it's able to absorb uh, nutrients uh, and to secrete various electrolytes. <clears throat> the, our problem, I think, with this whole system is that it takes really months uh, and it's very labor intensive and it's actually quite expensive. So we've been able to, to generate uh, IPS lines from a number of different patients. Many of them are here at UCLA. For instance, patients with microvillus inclusion disease, tufting enteropathy, patient with a, a PCSK1 mutation, uh, ADAM17 mutation, 
Um, these are all uh, essentially disorders that result in intestinal failure. And uh, we've been able to reprogram them and take each of them down through the whole process to develop kind of gut intestinal epithelium. So I'm not going to talk any further about our pluripotent stem cell approach, but I'm going to talk to you more about our somatic stem cell work. So our group was really uh, the, the first to describe the growth of human epithelium using a, uh, a, a um, myofibroblast in a, basically in culture with the gut epithelium. Um, and what we show here actually is without uh, a myofibroblast layer, we're able to take somatic stem cells that we isolate by fact sorting or by just isolating crypts through methods that we've developed, place them in culture with the right reagents, some of which are, are listed here, and in a matrigel setting, you actually get very nice growth of epithelium, uh, as you can see here, uh, on a f this is kind of a flat structure, and it turns out if you do staining, what you'll see here is that this is actually a stem cell component that actually continues to produce uh, progenitors and differentiated cells. So this is work that we've been doing for the last uh, several years. We also developed and described kind of the first method to do fact sorting uh, from uh, human intestinal samples uh, that we get through the pathology department here at UCLA, their discarded samples. So we used a combination of various cell surface markers, including uh, EPCAM, CD133, uh, CD24 uh, low, and CD44 to actually isolate the stem cell population. And you can see within 24 days, we really get nice growth of, um, of essentially intestinal epithelium. And if you look at the phenotype, you'll see that these uh, enteroids, which is what we call them, actually have endocrine cells, they have goblet cells that you can see up here. Uh, they also have panath cells, and they are really exclusively epithelial cells. Uh, I think the more exciting work that we've been uh, started to do in the last year is really try to find a better way to do a big expansion, uh, because the intestine certainly is a very large surface area. Uh, it's not like we're trying to replace a small organ like a pituitary gland. And so what we needed to do is to develop methods to do a massive expansion in a very short time period. So what you can see here are really two different structures um, from human small bowel, uh, one that's called spheroids and one that's called entroids. All the other uh, data that I showed you earlier were from entroids, and entroids, if you do uh, RNA-seq or staining, actually contains a stem cell population uh, TA cells, progenitors, and basically all the differentiated cell lines. Um, but if you're able to, what we did is we were able to isolate myofibroblasts and treat them in a certain way where uh, we can convert CRIPS or even these entroids to look like spheroids. And when you do RNA sequencing of, or RNA seq of spheroids, what you'll see, and you can't really appreciate it in the back, but essentially these cell, this cell type really has no markers of differentiated cells. It also has no markers of progenitor cells either. They're really exclusively markers of some type of, of stem cell population. So we've been working uh, trying to try to find the ideal way to maximally increase uh, our our ability to expand spheroids, because we think that these are cells that are essentially going through symmetric cell division. Uh, and that really illustrates this point here, where uh, typically in the intestine, uh, under homeostatic conditions, you have a stem cell that will make a copy of itself and actually produce one uh, differentiated cell and another stem cell population, but what we think happen is happening with the spheroids is that these cells are going through symmetric division where uh, you get basically copies of, um, of itself. So you get essentially stem cells that produce more stem cells. So here's an example of kind of our usual um, success. 
uh, we can passage the, this using these methods that we've been developing indefinitely, okay? And uh, it's actually shown here. It turns out that prostaglandins actually can be used to do marginal expansion. So if you use PGE2 and you put them into entro on entroids or, in, or on crypts, eventually you're only able to expand to about 80, 81 wells um, in a 48 well plate, for instance. But if you apply condition media uh, that we develop in the lab uh, from the myofibroblast, you're actually able to get a massive expansion. And you can see you go from basically 80, this is a, um, a log score, log uh, ratio, and we're able to get up to 60,000 wells, essentially, using this particular method. So, and we can do it basically by passage 10. And we do each passage, each passage takes about four days. So we can do a massive expansion in a very short time period. Now, it's good to have stem cells for expansion purposes, but at some point you have to have cells that will differentiate. And so, and you can see here that with, here is a spheroid population, and then we changed the media essentially, removed our conditioned media, put differentiation media, and then within 48 hours you get basically get um, entroids, and usually by about a week or so you start seeing kind of the more differentiated cell types uh, that are present. So uh, we think this is going to be important because it's a, a way of massively expanding the stem cell population and then inducing differentiation. So one of our goals basically, of course, is going to be to try to get these, um, these spheroids or eventually these enteroids back into the small bowel. And what uh, Hassan Khalil, who is a surgical fellow, has done in the lab is he's isolated GFP enteroids from mouse and was able to make a, um, a blind loop in the small bowel uh, and basically uh, a blind loop where he removed the native stem cells and put in these GFP positive stem cells. And I think this is five days later you can see that we get actually very nice staining, and you'll see in the subsequent slide that he continues to have basically GFP positive epithelium. So he was able to ablate the native epithelium and put in green epithelium, and you'll see once again in the next slide that, uh, that this goes out actually for several weeks. We're also trying this now. We were successful in doing this for five days, um, basically using human spheroids. Uh, we're trying to get the not skid mouse to actually survive um, this type of surgery, but I think uh, Hassan should be able to get it to work soon. Here's the latest image. This is actually day six. Uh, this is mouse epithelium. You can see it's green. And you, we were able, he was able to actually essentially embed spheroids and within six days get very nice green structures. So here's the other reason why I think this is going to be important. Uh, we frequently don't have access to surgical samples, but we, as gastroenterologists, we do, do, uh, do perform endoscopies on patients. And so here's an example of a, one child with microvillus inclusion disease. We took isolated two endoscopic biopsies that are very small, the size of, of the tip of your pencil, essentially put that in culture in a 24 well plate and within and basically added our condition media developed spheroids we were able to do get a massive expansion from one well of a 24 well plate to four plates of a 24 well plate covered essentially with these spheroids and then we converted them when we needed to for our analysis and you can look at it here so this is going to be uh, certainly a nice way to, to understand disorders uh, like microvillus inclusion disease or tufting enteropathy or a number of other uh, epithelial disorders. Um, but it's also going to be helpful certainly for, uh, eventually we think, for therapeutic purposes. All right, so here's a list of, of uh, the people who made all this possible. Uh, I, most of this work, most of the IPS work 
was done with James Burns uh, and uh, Sergio Solan Solozano, who's in, actually in my laboratory, and he's the one that's been doing, making most of the IPS work. All of the somatic gut stem cell work was done in collaboration with James Dunn, who's the head of ped surgery here, and Matthias Stelzner, who runs surgery at the VA as part of our NIH-funded U01 um, stem cell uh, consortium. And really, a lot of, uh, of this work was really made possible by Garrett Brinkley, who just left last week for his, uh, to the University of Alabama's MD-PhD program, uh, and Hassan Khalil and Upindra Kar. Um, so these were uh, actually the work of a lot of individuals that made this possible. Good.